my story is that I went to the University of Texas, got a business degree, and at age 22 got married a year later, had a child, and was vigorously embarked in the television business. And I was very intense about business. I ran a company. Uh, my mom died in 1971, so I was the oldest family member. And we ran a company that grew at 28% a year for a dozen years. And that, is, I mean, that's pretty all-absorbing. You need to kind of keep your wits about you and pay attention to what's going on when you're driving that fast. What I hear a lot of is, is I had my life on cruise control. I wasn't living my own life. I, I was living a life to make money or to make my mark in the world. But I didn't feel like uh, I had control of my life. I'd given control of my life over to, over to some enterprise or some, uh, just something else. Uh, an early kind of stop for me was in my mid-30s. Some, somebody came to me and said, you're so intense about business, it's just frightening. And you're, yeah, you're scary. And I began to ask myself, what am I going to lose in all this gaining that I'm doing? I mean, what, what's the point and what are the things that are really valuable to me? And I think if you're in your 30s, the, the thing you're seeking probably, if you've, if you've been in business 10 years or so and you're, you're pretty intense about it, is some sense of balance. So I went and sat under a tree one day with my day timer and uh, took some notes and said, if I really had everything I wanted out of my life, what would be those things? What, what would be the elements in a perfect life? And for me, there were, there were six. But the main idea was that there be more than one, more than this uh, compulsive drive to build this television company. And the things I said I better pay attention to are I wanted to stay married to the same person I was married to in the first place and find myself more in love with her at age 62 than I was at age 22 when we, uh, when we got married. Uh, I wanted to uh, grow my company at this kind of obscene rate. I, I put down I wanted to grow the company at 10% a year because I thought the other was just too much. But that wasn't what I meant. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, I wanted my son to grow up and have high, uh, feel good about himself. We read Bible stories every night and until he kind of kicked me out of that routine, which they do at some time. Um, I'm, I'm a lifelong student. I didn't want to go brain dead in the process of all that uh, compulsive acquiring. And then I said, you know, if you compound anything at 10 or 15 or some percent, uh, you know, a million here, a million there, pretty soon it adds up to real money if you do it for 30 years. Money's always been important to me, and I think money is important to most people in, in our culture. But I think the question is, to what end? What, why am I doing all this? And for me, around age 40, I began to have a sense that there was something more. You're doing your work one day, and you're, you're intense about it, but all of a sudden it doesn't have the charge it used to have. There comes a time when you just say, to what end? I mean, what's the, what's the point of all that I've done? What's the point of this life? And I assure you that the point of it is that your whole life has prepared you to do something that, at least I believe, for me, God has in mind. And I think it's the mission of halftime and the journey of the second half to find out what that is. Halftime is now where the, where the great boomer population is. That leading edge is in their middle 50s. And plenty of people are asking, is this all there is? I felt like when I was doing success, and, and when you do success, I think in a way you're the you become the, the prisoner of your, of your dream, whatever it is. And I felt like I was kind of a fighter pilot locked on a target, and wherever that target went, 
is, uh, is where I would go. In my uh, late 50s, I discovered that a lot of people, including me, were in halftime and asking a lot of questions about what comes next in my life. What, what now? In my case, I'm an entrepreneur and a multiplier, so I just started doing in, uh, in nonprofit or kingdom work what I was doing in, in television and cable television. I, I just start something new every, every five years or so. And for most people I see who successfully make the transition I talk about from success to significance, it involves what I call a parallel career. That alongside your day job and alongside raising your family and going to church and the things you do, you begin to do things and allocate more and more of yourself over time to serving others. I was a business entrepreneur and a uh, and a social entrepreneur simultaneously until July 28, 1999. At 9.38 in the morning, a wire transfer came this way and the equity in my company went that way. Um, in a big, I was quartered in a big law firm in Dallas, 54 floors above downtown Dallas, hermetically sealed uh, from any, any distress, everybody was you know how it is when you're making a deal. The investment bankers and lawyers are kind of tippy-toeing around, less if they sneeze, one of the parties is going to come unhitched. Halftime is a tipping point. It's a change of season. I, I call it a metamorphosis from one, one season to another. It's uh, a time of living out your faith ra rather than uh, simply listening to others. It's a time when you when you become a player and not just a spectator. And for me, it's been like just shifting the weight off of one foot of my life gradually over to another foot, and then finally putting all the weight on, uh, on the kingdom part. You've got to really follow the promptings that come kind of out of the deepest, truest part of yourself to to uh, live out the life you were meant to live. People, people know, people know that there's, that there's something more and they, they just need to get at it. My great friend and mentor, Peter Drucker, says that the symbol of this metamorphosis, this uh, coming from being a caterpillar to a butterfly, is to develop a t-shirt that has the mission statement for the second half of your life on it. Uh, my current mission statement is to multiply my life a hundredfold by investing my life in the, uh, in the lives of people like Joe Calhoun and Reed and John and, the, and all of you uh, this morning to uh, multiply a hundredfold, which is the parable of the sower in the Bible. That I, I really do believe that, that God has given each of us the capacity to multiply, just like that parable says, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And of those, I like 100 of, of the three. I liked that when I was in business, and I still like it uh, right now. I, d I don't have a business card that says that, but my T-shirt says... Uh, says 100x on the front it says to be the the soil the seed fell in and multiplied a hundred times the backside says that and this took me eight years to determine and, and a relationship with peter drucker which is pretty serious assistance uh, the backside says it's your mission to work on transforming the latent energy in american christianity into active energy and that's what I uh, plan to work on for the duration. I'm, I'm in it to the death. What I find about the second half is it's always embedded in the first half of your life. If, uh, you know, people say, first of all, they say, how do you know you're in halftime? And all I can say is you know when you know. 
Halftime for me is about finishing strong. And when I think about that, I think often of Peter Drucker at age 92, who's working on two big projects as we speak, and who's just written a 20-page section for The Economist magazine titled The Next Society, where he's helping the rest of us understand what the what the future holds for us. That The Economist would pick Peter to write that section at age 92 should be uh, a great encouragement to all of us. It certainly is to me. Look, we all of us need to, to wake up and kind of live in the light of eternity. Uh, that's where we're going to spend most of our time, in, in a pleasant or unpleasant state. And, I mean, it doesn't quit when it quits, folks. Uh, you know, it keeps on going. If eternity were were, you know, characterized by a line that began somewhere on the other side of that wall and extended somewhere to the other side of the other wall here, the time we're living in is just a scratch. It's just a scratch. I lost my only son at 24 years old. And, uh, you know, it could happen to any of us, anytime. When we come to the end of our lives and uh, come to that joyous or perhaps sad moment when we face our creator God, I visualize the entrance exam into heaven that wraps up our whole lives here on earth as having two questions. The first question will obviously be, what did you do about Jesus? It was on the lips of your friends and uh, you heard in many ways and many times. The second question, though, will be, what did you do with what I gave you to work with? Not Billy Graham to work with, not Mother Teresa, not a, a famous pastor, but, but you, just the gifts and experiences in your life. I just want to uh, get you in a good place where you can give, give a, a good accounting when the final accounting comes, because it's, it's really the one that counts. Have a wonderful day. It's a great season in life, halftime, and I assure you the best is yet to come.